morning, y'all. So um, I want to talk to you about, um, I have two kids, and pretty much if they're awake, they are loud, and they are crazy. And I feel like my house is in chaos pretty much all the time. And that's just not my personality. So I easily get overwhelmed by that. And very often, I'll just get to the point of frustration where I get up and I turn my worship music on as loud as I can and I'm like, okay, I can breathe. And um, I'm like, my mood has changed and everything is gonna be okay because now my focus is on the goodness of God instead of all the chaos that's going on around me. But every time I do that, I'm like, why didn't I do this two hours ago? Why did I wait to the point where I felt like I have completely lost my mind? Um, and better yet, why don't I, before I even put my feet on the ground in the morning, have a mindset of worship? Worship is saying, God, I thank you that you are good even in the chaos. I choose to be joyful and not overwhelmed. I have an assignment today that I might not see if I am consumed in my own self-pity. Jack, my sweet husband, he always tells me, don't let your day determine your attitude. Let your attitude determine your day. Second Corinthians tells us to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. We all have an assignment, every single one of us, even if it seems like it's small. Most of the time, my assignment is spanking children and making sure there's a hot meal on the table for my family at the end of the day. But I want to do those things with um, a heart of worship. I want to do those things with thanksgiving and I want to do those things with joy. So I just wanted to encourage y'all this morning and remind you that we do have the ability to take our thoughts captive. And we have the ability to take our focus off of the chaos around us and shift it to the goodness of God. When our focus is on Jesus, we'll have a better understanding of what our assignment is supposed to be. And that is an attitude of worship. So God, I thank you this morning for everything that you do. I ask that you would clear our minds, help us to clear our minds this morning and show us what our assignment is. God, I thank you that when our focus is on you, everything else is silenced. I thank you that each and every one of us has a purpose and we have a calling on our life, Lord. We worship you this morning, and we honor you this morning, in Jesus' name. Where people 
Come on. To do whatever you want to. Come on, sing it. because his way is better his way will produce life in you when the enemy comes to accuse the brethren what do you got to lay down to make room See, we just went through and still going through shaking. And here's the thing about a shaking. <clears throat> when you begin to shake, things will begin to fall off that need to fall off. But what that allows to do also is the thing that God is putting in you it's making room for more come on somebody needs to get a hold of that right there just because you may be going through a shaking and a mashing and there's things in your life falling off it's so that God can put more in you of him see that's his way He's not just going to shake things off of you and leave you empty. Leave you barren. No, he's going to shake it down, press it to where it's overflowing. If you'll learn how to give up that which he has shaken off. Father, we come to you. We thank you today for what you're doing in our life. Lord, help us to see clearly what you're doing in us. That we can get on board with what you're doing in us. And Father, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, come on. of my message is his purpose became our why and the more we've had such a just such a busy last several weeks and man the, the more I chewed on this the more I chewed on it in, in spurts and in spots and waking up early in the mornings and the Lord just you know that it seems like he'll download stuff in you and you'll see it you, as you're chewing on a scripture or something. And this is probably, I mean, if y'all if are not accustomed to taking notes, I want to encourage you this morning, take notes. Because, uh, man, it's just, it, it's, it's good. And it's, and, I don't, it, and it's him. I'm telling you, it's just him. And, and, and he is doing a new thing. And that's, what's, that, that's what excites me is that he's putting revelation out there. We have to grab a hold of it. And let me tell you something. If you'll jot stuff down and you'll get a hold of this, if you'll take notes on Sunday morning, you'll, you'll, you'll get three messages out of one message. He'll begin to give you revelation from now on out of what he's saying. It's just how it works. And, uh, and so I, I just think this is a powerful message that is going to set some folks free in here for him to do more, for, him, for you to see how much he loves you and how much he wants for you. Because I'm telling you right now, you can't imagine how much he wants for you. And, uh, and so... We're going to look at some things, and one thing I think 
that we see that, that you'll notice when you start reading the Gospels is that Jesus is always working on their thinking. He's always trying to prepare them for his purpose and what he's going to accomplish. Let me say that again. He's always working on their thinking for his purpose and what he's going to accomplish for the kingdom. That's never changed. He's always working on our thinking for how we see things, our perspective for what he's accomplishing. Come on. And so we just, you know, his purpose became our why. And what's so sad is, is the more I started going through this, I began to see how we got away from inspiring people and equipping people to motivate people. See, when it all became about the preacher, then you weren't being equipped anymore. See, that was happening in Jesus' day. The scribes and Pharisees, they were just propping themselves up. Come on. And they weren't motivating people for the kingdom of God. Matthew chapter 16. We read this last week. We're going to look at it again. In verse 13. Now when Jesus came into the district, Caesarea Philippi, he began asking his disciples saying, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, but others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered, said, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered, said, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not overpower it. I will give to you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now, there is three things that are very powerful here. What he did was, is he inspired them. This is revelation, and this is going to change your life. And then he said, you're going to be equipped. You're going to be equipped with a set of keys. Listen, you can park every piece of equipment in the world out in front of your house, but if you ain't got a key to it, it does you absolutely no good. You got to take your keys that you've been given with a piece of equipment, and then you've got to use that to turn it on. Now, I'm telling you, I got a set of keys in my truck that will boggle your mind. Because over the years, drivers would bring equipment and they'd drop it off and they'd take the key with them because they knew I had a set of keys. I've got keys to all kinds of equipment. Matter of fact, if you got a piece of equipment sitting in front of your house, I could probably come get it. <laughs> I, have, I even got the cat master key. See, there's a key to a caterpillar that'll get you in the door and can start it, but if you don't have the master key, you ain't starting it. I got two of those. Come on. See, if you've got the keys, you're equipped then. And that motivates you to do something. Come on. See, we've got to be inspired, equipped, and motivated. And when the church got away from that, we lost a whole lot of ground. We lost a lot of ground that we weren't possessing, being fruitful, and multiplying. Come on, is anybody in here with me? 
See, we have the authority to control the gates that the enemy has been keeping locked because we have the keys. Come on. See, it's a fool's idea. And I don't say that lightly. It is a fool's ideal and doctrines of demons to say when you repent and say a prayer after repeating it that you've got all you're going to get. Come on. You, you haven't gotten all you're going to get. It's just the entrance to everything you're being equipped. Come on. And motivated for. See, when we teach that thought and that line of thinking, we're not equipping for the battle to possess our land or the gates of our enemies. In Exodus 23, this one scripture probably changed my entire life. In verse 30, it says, I will drive them out before you little by little until you become fruitful and take possession of the land. Now, here's what I'm telling you. When I really first came to Christ, there was a lot of things that religious people are telling me I've got to give up. That's not what you want to tell somebody that's got a lot going on is you got to quit doing all this stuff because all the stuff they want you to quit doing is just on the outside. When God said, little by little, I'm going to teach you how to possess the land. I'm going to teach you how to be fruitful and multiply. Come on, are y'all hearing what I'm saying? Because there's going to be times that you, there's some battles you're going to face that, hey, all the people that just uh, miraculously were able to quit dipping, smoking, drinking, cussing, and all that. Come on. <laughs> Praise God. It didn't happen that way for Dave. <laughs> just didn't happen that way. And so God showed me this little by little. I'm going to teach you how to possess the land. That put stewardship on me. That put stewardship that I'm going to have to learn how to possess this, not all the negative thoughts, not all the fearful thoughts, not all the doubting thoughts, not all, the, come on. I'm going to have to learn how to possess this. I'm going to have to learn how to endure I'm going to have to learn how to be faithful. Listen, God's not just going to come wake you up and say, hey, you need to go to church. You're going to have to get up and go. Come on. God's not going to make you do anything. Why? Because you're a free will being, and he loves you enough for you to make that choice. But he says, if you will, I'll teach you how to be fruitful and multiply. Because that's what I called you to do. Come on. Deuteronomy 7, verse 22, it says, listen, he repeating it again to the next generation. See, the mandate's never changed. The mandate never changes. It's just every now and then he has to repeat it so we can get it. And so in Deuteronomy, he's telling the next generation, and the Lord your God will clear away these nations. What nations? All the Hittites, the Idiotites, the Selfishites, the cut you off in trafficites, the take your moneyites, the bill collectorites. Come on. He says, before you little by little, you will not be able to put an end to them quickly. What? It's not just in a bag of fairy dust or you wave a wand? You ain't Santa Claus? No, he's not. 
He says, you'll not be able to put an end to them quickly lest the wild beasts grow too numerous for you. See, that's all part of showing up to the battle. We still have to saddle up. We still have to prepare. We still have to do things and get ready. Now, he will fight our battles, and he will clear them away. He will give us clear directions on where to shoot our arrows. Come on. See, once you have a revelation that God wants you blessed, but it's going to take a fight, then you'll understand he's not always mad at you. There may be something that he's shaking off so that he can shake into. Come on. We have to develop a mindset to stand firm. When you first come to Christ, you don't know nothing about standing firm. You just don't know that, that it's going to be a battle. When all you're told is, I'm saying a prayer, I'm going to heaven. See, but when you understand that you're going to have to take your stand, and when you've done all that you can do to stand, you're still going to have to stand some more. See, and that takes a mindset that you're going to have to learn and work yourself into to be able to possess and be fruitful to be able to multiply. See, it's by his design that we possess, be fruitful, and multiply. Look in Romans. For all the, that's Old Testament preacher. I get that a lot. Well, that's the old covenant. <laughs> that always cracks me. When, when, if you come up to me and say, that's Old Testament, that's Old Covenant, we're not living by that no more. The first thing I think of is you ain't read your Bible. That's the first thing I think. Happy birthday, Bradbury. What, are you forgetting them now or what? Trying to. <laughs> I was looking at some pictures the other day in my desk, and I was thinking, man, we've been a long time. Remember when Rusty had big glasses, that big around, long hair? Oh, yeah, those were the good old days, weren't they? <laughs> that long hair. Wish you could get that hair now. I hear you. Verse 26, we read this, Romans chapter 8. Everybody can recite Romans chapter 8, verse 28. God works all things together for the good, but we really haven't understood the whole thing. Let's start in 26. And in the same way, the Spirit also helps our weakness. For we do not know how to pray, as we should. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. What did Jesus tell us right off the bat? He said, I must go that he must come, and he's going to lead you and guide you in all the truth, right? Why? Because we just don't know. We just don't know. What did God say in Exodus and Deuteronomy? That little by little he will... See, the truth is that was their ground and somebody else was occupying it. Somebody else had the keys to their house. Somebody had the keys to their farm. Come on. Verse 27, And he who searches the hearts, which is the Holy Spirit, knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he intercedes for the saints. You have somebody interceding for you the will of God for your life. Because I'm telling you, if we had, it would just all be Skittles and rainbows. And we wouldn't learn anything. That's how come Adam messed up. The first Adam came as an adult who never went through anything he never knew what he was, come on. Jesus came as a baby and had to walk this thing out. 
Look what he says. According to the will of God. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God and those who are called according to his purpose. That is his design and his order for your life. And his design and order, listen, just forget what and concentrate on the part that he wants you to be able to possess and be fruitful and multiply. The what will take care of itself. Too many people get caught up in, oh, God, what's my purpose? Am I wasting my time on this job? Am I wasting my time at school? Am I wasting my time over here? Am I wasting, you know, because people want to know their purpose. No, you do what you're doing right there. Too many people are so worried about what their purpose is that they forget to possess and be fruitful where they're at. And so we get so caught up in, am I doing what God's called me to do? Am I doing this? I'm doing, is God mad at me? I must be, he must be mad at me and I must not be doing what I'm doing because I just think, the next thing you know, we're like a little squirrel running around trying to find a nut. Come on. When things come at us, God says, I'm going to work that out. You just stand firm, saddle up, prepare He's going to lead you and guide you in the truth. I'm not mad at you, but I'm taking you somewhere. There's something in you that you need to change your religious mindset or that doctrine you thought was right and it's not right. Come on. You've been listening to fear. You've been listening to doubt. You've become a skeptic. You've become a cynical. You cynical. You become judgmental. You become critical. Come on. And you're forgetting that life is not that hard. And now you're caught up in all this drama. Come on. Look what he says. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son. See, we are being conformed to the image of his son. Why? Because he wants sons, he wants daughters. He didn't send Jesus to get a membership. He didn't send Jesus to the cross just so he could get more members. God wants sons and daughters that reflect his will here on this earth. Come on. His heart. To become conformed to the image of his son that he might be Firstborn among many brethren. Jesus was just the firstborn among many brethren. Of many of his brothers and sisters. Come on. In whom he predestined, these he also called. In whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. Look in verse 1, for 31. When then, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? In other words, you are not the victim. We don't have to make excuses about our past. We don't have to make excuses about what somebody else has done to us. We don't have to make excuses Come on. Because a lot of times what keeps us from going forward is our excuses and our buts. But God, but, but, yo, but will hold you back. Come on. See, God established his word and his covenant then he fulfilled it through Christ. Now we can walk in his purpose, his design for our life, no matter what bad thing comes at us. All things work together for our good because we love him, because we understand he established his word, he established his covenant, 
that I can be free and I can possess and I can be fruitful and I can multiply. Come on. And I can possess the gates of my enemies. Come on. Look in verse 32. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all. Who, how will he not also with him freely give us some things? Some things. Why do we accept that he's just going to give us some things, but he's not going to give us this? Because we've been too, uh, we did too much. We, we sinned too much or we, come on, are y'all hearing what I'm saying? Because the devil's been telling us that for years. Oh, you messed up, so you're only going to get some things. You're only going to get salvation. You're only going to be able to just receive Christ and hang out until, come on, is anybody? You can't, you can't be that blessed, Luke. I don't know why you always act like you're royalty, Luke. Let me, if you hang around Luke for a little while, he's going to tell you I am royalty. And he makes no apology about it. We shouldn't. Because the word tells us he'll give us all things. See, that's why when you wake up, Haley, every morning, you get an attitude of, man, I am blessed. Highly favored. Today, I own today. Kids, line up for a spanking. Let's just get it over with now. <laughs> you, you know, <laughs> I know you're going to make me mad today. I'm going to own this moment. <laughs> that cracked me up. But everybody knows exactly what she's talking about. Because we've all been there till we just lose our mind. You know? little two foot feller has done real huh Jess she's got one <laughs> oh praise the Lord little by little we're learning how to be fruitful and multiply Matthew chapter 7. If you then being evil know how to know how it to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your father who is in heaven give what is good to those who ask him? How do we miss these scriptures? How do we misinterpret God wants us to ask and God wants to give us? If we, being evil, know how to give good gifts, how much more our Heavenly Father? And we want to tell people, you got all you're going to get. You're just going to heaven. Come on. Listen, I'm telling you, the thing about it is the devil don't want us asking the devil wants us thinking God's mad at us so that we won't ask because he's got so much for you. The devil wants to try to convince you you're not worthy. That's called shame. That's why God hates shame because shame leads to unworthiness. I'm not worthy when he said, I've already sent my son to die for you just like you are because I love you that much. So you are very worthy. Come on. See, it is a fool's idea to say, well, God's too busy and I don't want to bother him. Come on, how many times y'all ever heard somebody say that? I've heard people say that. 
well, I don't want to ask God for nothing. I know he's busy, and I know. Maybe that suggests that God's not in control. That suggests that God's not on the throne, and he's up there wringing his hands how he's trying to figure out what to do with this old corrupt world. No. God is able and willing, and he's up there waiting for us to ask. <laughs> Well, I just don't know about that. I don't want to bother him. Look in Matthew chapter 10. I love this. Y'all getting anything out of this? Listen, and, 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 and here's the thing about this message. It empowers you to help somebody else's thinking out. Because I'm telling you, everybody somewhere has got somebody sitting at home that is just all jacked up and thinking that just life, this is just how life is. I'm a good person, but this is just where I'm at. Come on. Matthew chapter 10, verse 7. And as you go, he didn't say if you go. He said, as you go, preach saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now look what he says. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons, freely you received, freely give. Come on. As you go. As you go. Take the kingdom of God with you. As you go, you're going to take the kingdom of God with you and then start laying hands on them. Start possessing the land because here's what's going to happen. The miracles are confirming that the kingdom is at hand. Come on, things in your life are going to confirm that God is at work in you. People are going to be able to see God in you because they're going to be able to understand, hey, something's different about you here lately. Something's changed. What, what's that change? What am I seeing? What's going on? Listen, the same God that did, it was so, it, it was great. We met with uh, some people, the other, uh, two guys the other day that wrote this book, and I'm going to be getting it to some of you men. It's called A Journey to Manhood. Is that right? Yeah. And uh, one, of, one of the guys is a youth pastor. And I asked him, I said, how many times have you been asked one question? Where is the God in the Bible that did the miracles? And he was like, yeah. This generation wants to experience God. They want to see God. They are tired of of hearing, you got to get saved. You got to get saved. They're tired of hearing that. Listen, we are the kingdom of God. We are the sons and daughters of the Most High God. Yes, we're going to say a prayer and receive Jesus in our life as Lord and Savior. And yes, we're going to get baptized. Yes, we're going to do all that. But the emphasis is not on just because you went and got dunked and then nothing changes. All you did was get wet. Come on. But something has to internally begin to change you. And that's why a lot of times when you do say that prayer and then you're frustrated, it's because you're not allowing God to shake some things off so he can put some things in. Come on. Listen. The miracles confirm the fact that the authority of the kingdom is at hand. It was made manifest right before their very eyes. And they experienced the kingdom of heaven here on earth. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Come on. That's why Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 
He said, my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. Look what he says. So that your faith would not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. There's nothing wrong with wisdom of men and trying to find a word that inspires people. There's nothing wrong with that. But we also need to be able to see the Spirit of God who is alive and who is at work. My God, we had to make a movie. Duck Dynasty had to make a movie of God's Not Dead to explain that God's not dead. <laughs> Come on. It took a bunch of bearded guys living in a swamp to make God cool again. It's that simple. A bunch of Cajuns. Come on. To make God relevant again. Come on. Are y'all with me? See, Paul understood the principle of the kingdom authority. And let me tell you who else understands kingdom authority. The devil. Let me tell you something. The devil understands the kingdom authority. When those seven sons of Sceva thought they were going to just throw the name of Jesus out there and cast out a demon, what did the demon say? Jesus I know, Paul I've heard about, but who are you? And next thing you know, they're butt naked running down the road. They understand authority because here's the deal. When you address a demon, you need to understand that you're covered in the blood and they don't see you. They're seeing Jesus. And I'm telling you, that's the greatest revelation I ever got in, 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 in doing deliverance is that they're not looking at you. They're looking at Jesus. If they're looking at you, they're whipping you. Come on now. So don't tell me that we're not to walk and, the, and be the image of him. Come on. Look in Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6, verse 41. We'll read through 43. He took the five loaves and two fish, looking up toward heaven. He blessed the food. He blessed the food. Look here. Underline, looking up toward heaven. And he blessed, underline, blessed the food. And broke, underline, broke the loaves, and he kept giving, underline giving, them to the disciples to set before them, and he divided up the two fish among them all, and they all ate and were satisfied, and they picked up 12 full baskets of the broken pieces and also of the fish. Now, the first thing Jesus did is he recognized the kingdom of heaven. He recognized the kingdom of heaven in his life. He recognized that I'm fixing to take what I've got. I'm fixing to take the what. And I'm going to, God, I thank you that you're going to bless what I have. Come on, are y'all hearing me? And then he broke it. To give. And he kept breaking, and he kept giving. He kept breaking, and he kept giving. Listen, what was it doing? It was multiplying. When we acknowledge God, when we ask him to bless what we have, 
he begins to make it fruitful to be able to multiply as we're breaking to give it. If you get it and you don't recognize God in it and you don't, come on, that's why tithing is so important. That's why sowing into kids is so important. That's why doing something excellent is so important. Listen, I can just see the religious folks sitting around going, my God, they hate, look at all what they're wasting. What? Look at that, all their weight. Look at, they had 12 baskets left over and didn't do nothing with it. That's all they got out of that because they didn't understand what was going on. They didn't understand the principle. That's why they kept hoarding up. Jesus told the Pharisees and the scribes, I say, you say honor your father and mother, but you won't give to them what you think. Come on, he just calls them out on it all the time. Knowledge of God, what you have, what you do. Cole, what you do. What y'all do, barrel race, bull riding, it doesn't matter what it is, bulls, what you do, acknowledge God, come on. If you're a carpenter, acknowledge God. If you're a truck driver, acknowledge God. It doesn't matter what you do. If you're a nurse, acknowledge God. Doesn't matter. Acknowledge God, ask him to bless it, come on, and then be willing to, to give. Come on, man. And it'll multiply. It'll multiply. And you'll be fruitful. Yeah, listen, fruitful is having so much that you got 12 baskets left over. See, that's what brings glory to God. When we're able to bless it, be broken, and give it. See, when we take and bless what's given, you can't, you can't help to see the manifestation of the kingdom of heaven. See, that brings glory to God, and that becomes our why. It doesn't matter what we're doing, but we bring glory to God. If you're a housewife, that housewife just brought glory to God today. Come on. That's bringing glory to God, recognizing that I need heaven. I need, come on, to worship. I need to start my day off. Come on. Let me tell you something. I'm going to tell you, you can write this down. In 16 years, you watch who's going to be up here on this platform. Playing a piano. Wailing on them drums. It's going to be them kids. It's going to be her kids that she whooped every morning. <laughs> Come on. See, that brings glory to God. And that's our why. To give him glory. It doesn't matter what you're doing. Come on, we get so lost and wrapped up. What's my purpose? I don't know what I'm called to do. I don't know what I'm... You're called to give him glory. Right where you're at every day. Luke chapter 6. It's so powerful. I'm trying to hurry. I got three minutes. Luke chapter 6, verse 31. And just as you want people to treat you, treat them in the same way. Let me tell you something. Here, here's what's amazing about God is there's principles that God has that you don't even have to, you, you can be a heathen and make these principles work. They'll work because they're that powerful. 
And just as you want people to treat you, treat them in the same way. And if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. That's why some people would rather be in a bar than in church. Come on. I'm telling you, there's, there's people in bars love each other. They're going to change Colorado to the state of love. Everybody smoking dope up there. Everybody loving each other. <laughs> and if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? And even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those, do good to you. If you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lead and if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners in order to receive back the same. But love your enemies and do good and lend expecting nothing in return. And your reward will be great. And you will be sons. You will be sons. Look here. You'll be sons. You're not peasants. You're not orphans. Come on. You're sons. You're sons and your daughters of the Most High. For he himself, this rocked me. And I hope you get this. For he himself is kind to ungrateful and evil men. Praise God. Praise God. Because I can be ungrateful. Unkind. Come on. And yet he's still kind to me. Look what he says. Be merciful just as your father is merciful. Do not judge and you will not be judged. Do not condemn and you will not be condemned. Pardon, and you will be pardoned. Look in verse 38. Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. Hmm. They will pour into your lap. For by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you in return. I'm telling you right now, there's people left here because their standards were way higher than ours, and they apparently are a lot more smarter and more holier than we all are. God forbid we ever get so holy. Come on. Let me tell you something. I might make some wrong decisions, but you can bet it was on the side of mercy. If I'm in error, it's because I'm showing mercy. Because I need mercy. I want to pardon people's, come on, Look in Luke chapter 16. Man, I'm telling you, I've never seen this. Never seen it. See, we need to be trained. That word trained. Oh, I never finished reading in Luke 6. Golly. Are y'all okay? Let me finish reading. And he also spoke a parable to them. A blind man cannot guide a blind man, can he? Will they not both fall into a pit? A pupil is not above his teacher, but everyone after he has been fully trained, fully trained will be like his teacher. Now, when you look that word up, fully trained, here's what it means. Repair, adjust, mend, prepare, restore, to put in full order, equip beforehand. That's what it means. It means to be trained. What are we being trained for? To possess 
and be fruitful so that we can multiply. Come on. So that we can be sons and daughters like the one who was born first of the Spirit. He says he was first, then here we come being trained like the teacher. He wasn't critical, judgmental. Come on. He said, Father, forgive them. Even when they were mistreating him. Come on, man. Now look in Luke 16. Look in verse 1. Now he was also saying to the disciples, there was a certain rich man who had a steward Look what he says, a steward. And, his, and this steward was reported to him as squandering his possessions. Now that word uh, reported kind of got me. And it got me to thinking and, and looking that word up, it's falsely accused. And so... You have people that write in the top of the chapter. Have you ever seen that? This one says, the unrighteous steward. But I'm here to tell you right now, it's not just about the steward. It's also about the employer. -er. And it's about the accuser. See, you have an accuser who is always trying to accuse you. It is reported that you're not being a good steward of the gifts and the talents that God gave you. You're not being a good steward of the what you're doing right now. You've got a devil that's going before God all the time accusing you. Mm. Look, and he called him and said, the employer called him and said to him, what is this I hear about you? Come on, don't believe everything you hear about me and I won't believe everything I hear about you. I know, Shawnee, they everybody talking about you. Come on, y'all hear what I'm saying? What is this I hear about you? Don't be a part of the devil's scandal. The devil's always wanting you to be a part of his scandal. He's wanting to use you to pull off his scandal. Why? Because he can't possess his own gates anymore. Man, somebody should have just jumped up and run around this place. He can't possess his own gates anymore, so he's always trying to get us to, he's always bidding us to do his work. Mm. What is this I hear about you? Give an account of your stewardship for you can no longer be steward. He fired him. Boom. And the steward said to himself, what shall I do since my master is taking the stewardship away from me? I'm not strong enough to dig at least this guy owned it, man. He said, I've been kicked back. I can't, I, don't put me on no shovel. Right? He said, I can't even dig. Not strong enough. And I'm ashamed to beg. <laughs> I know what I shall do. So that when I am removed from the stewardship, they will receive me into their homes. And he summoned each one of his master's debtors. And he began saying to the first, How much do you owe my master? And he said, A hundred measure of oil. And he said to me, Take your bill, sit down quickly, and write 50. Then he said to another, How much do you owe? And he said, A hundred measure of wheat. He said to him, Take your bill and write 80. And his master, his employer, not his employer, I'm sorry. He said his master. This word master means Lord. Now it's referring to Jesus. Come on, Jesus is about to bring this parable home. He's about to make a point. 
And Jesus praised the unrighteous steward because he had acted shrewdly for the sons of this age are more shrewd in relation to their own kind than the sons of light. In other words, this sucker had street smarts. He had something. He's Look, here's what I'm fixing to do. I'm fixing to turn this thing around. What the devil meant for bad. Come on, man. Is this not good? What the devil meant for bad, for my firing, my not, come on. Look, and I say to you, Jesus, I say to you, make friends for yourselves by means of the mammon of unrighteousness that when it fails they may receive you into the eternal dwellings man what listen while you're here on this earth you need money you need stuff and we've got a whole group of people oh, you just can't get stuff what? If you've got a hold of your stuff and you know what your what's for, it can give glory to God. Come on. There's nothing wrong with you having stuff. When you understand what it's for, come on. He who is faithful in a very little thing is faithful also in much. And he who is unrighteous in a very little thing is unrighteous also in much. See, he's given us some principles to be, in other words, to be able to occupy and steward while we're here. See, we've got to learn that what we do here matters. Because when we get to heaven, you're going to be surprised. It's, it, there's going to be a lot of things that we've learned to do here. We're still going to do up there. If therefore you have not been faithful in the use of unrighteous mammon, there it is. If therefore you have not been faithful in the use of unrighteous mammon, that's why we take it, we acknowledge God with it, and we bless it then he can multiply. Come on. Now look. <laughs> if therefore you have not been faithful in the use of unrighteous mammon, who will entrust the true riches to you? If you have not been faithful in the use of what which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? Come on, remember the pa parable of the talents and the minus? He here's what we've understood at what we do. We own nothing, but we are stewards of it. And we hold it real loosely because that's when he goes, you need to give that trailer to that man. We give the trailer to that man. Come on. When he says, give that bull to that, give that bull. What they do with it, that's up to them. Come on. But we hold those things loosely. Because we know when we acknowledge God in our what? He'll multiply. He'll bless it. Come on. I like the way the message says, Luke 16, 9. He says, I want you to be smart in the same way, but for what is right. Using every adversity to stimulate you to creative survival. Come on, adversity, when it comes against us, it should just make us creative. Why? Because we're making our stand and we know that we have the victory. 
to be able to possess and be fruitful and to multiply and that whatever adversity is coming our way, listen, we just stand firm because we know we're going to survive this and we're going to get smarter out of it. Come on. We're going to have, because all things work together for the good, for those who love God. So when adversity comes, we just have to start looking for what God's fixing to do. God's fixing to confirm the kingdom of heaven. I love it. To stimulate you to creative survival, to consecrate, concentrate your attention, there's your focus, to concentrate your attention on the bare essentials so you'll live really live and not complacently just get by on good behavior. I'm just just going to wait for heaven. I'm just going to try to be as good as I can. Come on. Come on, y'all stand with me. See, when you understand, when we understand the why, then you can be entrusted with more of the what. When we understand the why, we can be entrusted more with the what. See, there's nothing wrong with excellence. There, there's absolutely nothing wrong with excellence. And we've got a group trying to label it as entertainment, trying to label it as tickling our ears. And come on, are y'all hearing what I'm saying? There's nothing wrong with excellence. There's nothing wrong with having excellent uh, kids church. There's nothing wrong with having a nice sound system. There's nothing wrong with having nice chairs to sit on. Woo -woo. I've sat in church services on hay bales. Come on. nothing wrong with that there's nothing wrong with excellence there's nothing wrong with studying to have a great word see because here's the deal when I study to show myself approved when I study to get a good word that opens the door for my father to be able to minister to somebody. And that's what it's about. Being able to minister the gift that he's put on the inside of me. When we go somewhere, yeah, I'm, I'm studying the word. But I'm also, I'm trying to tune in to who he wants to speak to on a personal one-on-one -on -one level that only that person and God knows what's been going on. That's why we do what we do. That's why we acknowledge God in it. That's why we strive for excellence. Come on. That's what motivates us to be about the Father's business. Listen, His business is souls. His business is lives. Setting them free to be able to live their best life. To be able to be fruitful and multiply and possess. This was Jesus' purpose for coming. That was his purpose. His purpose to come was to reveal the Father and the sons. What does it say? All creation was longing for the revealing of the sons of God. What reveals them? When we look to heaven, acknowledge God, when we bless our what, Lord, bless our what, and it begins to multiply, confirming, yes, that we are the sons of God. Come on, there ain't nothing wrong with that.
Nothing wrong with that. And so as we leave here, we take every thought captive that exalts itself against the Word of God to keep us from being fruitful in multiplying and possessing. Come on, is that good? Father, we come to you today. Lord, we thank you that your purpose became our why. Lord, I pray as we leave out of here, I pray that what we do, what we do gives glory to you. Lord, teach us and guide us, Holy Spirit, how to take our what and glorify the kingdom of heaven. Lord, use us as your sons and daughters to bear the image of your son that will bring freedom in someone else's life to be able to possess, be fruitful, and to multiply, to be able to advance the kingdom. Father, I pray that we become, uh, that we become so steadfast in this assignment of making you known to give glory to the Father. Lord, we thank you. We surrender to that call and that purpose so that others can fulfill theirs. Lord, we thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, if you agree, give the Lord a hand. That's it for today. Be sure to like and subscribe below. And for more information on Dayton Christian Center, visit dcctx.church. We'll see you next week.